Hello and welcome. Thanks for coming to my talk. It's a jungle out there. What's really going on inside your node modules folder? My name is Faros and I'm an open source maintainer. I started WebTorrent, which is a peer-to-peer -peer file transfer protocol, and StandardJS, a linter that catches bugs and enforces code style. I've been doing open source since 2014 and have created over 100 NPM packages. In the past, I volunteered on the Node.js board of directors and I also teach a class on web security at Stanford University. Now I'm the founder of a startup called Socket, which helps protect the open source ecosystem. Before we get started, let me tell you a story. On January 13th, 2012, over 10 years ago, a developer named Faisal Salman published a new project to GitHub. It was called UA Parser JS, and it parsed user agent strings. Now, lots of people found this project useful. And so over the next 10 years, Faisal continued to develop the package along with the help from many open source contributors. He published 54 versions as the package grew in popularity. It eventually grew to 7 million downloads per week, eventually being used by nearly 3 million GitHub repositories. Now, let me tell you a different story. On October 5th, 2021, on a notorious Russian hacking forum, this post appeared. A hacker was offering to sell the password to an NPM account that controlled the package with over 7 million weekly downloads. His asking price was $20,000 for this password. Now, this is where the two stories intersect. Two weeks later, UA Parser JS was compromised and three malicious versions were published. Malware was added to these packages that would execute immediately whenever anyone installed one of the compromised versions. So now let's take a look at what that malware does. So this is the package JSON file for the compromised version. And you'll see that it uses a pre-install script. So this means that this command will run automatically anytime this package is installed. So now let's look at what that script does. So the first thing you'll see is that it splits uh, based on the operating system of the target. On Mac, nothing happens, which is lucky for Mac users. Uh, but Windows and Linux users aren't so lucky. And you'll see here that command prompt is spawned for each of these platforms uh, using childprocess.exec. So now let's take a look at what that preinstall.sh script does. The very first line fetches the user's country and uh, figures out whether the user is coming from Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, or Kazakhstan, and stores that in a variable. Now, if the user comes from one of those countries, then the script exits without doing anything further. However, if you come from any other country, then the script proceeds to download an executable file uh, from this IP address, mark that file as executable, and then run it. And now based on these command line flags, you can see here that this program is a Monero miner, which is going to be used to mine the Monero cryptocurrency for the attacker. Now this is the script on Windows. It's very similar. So it starts off with uh, downloading that same uh, or similar Monero miner, but it also downloads a DLL file as well and runs that. Uh, and then here you can see it just starting up the um, Monero miner and uh, registering the DLL file on Windows. Now, what does this extra DLL file do? Well, it steals passwords from over 100 different programs on the Windows machine, as well as all the passwords in the Windows Credential Manager. So yikes, this is a really nasty piece of malware. And uh, you know, anyone unlucky enough to run this um, lost all their passwords and had to do um, you know, kind of a, a complete reset of their online accounts. Not a fun time. So this is kind of the aftermath. So this package was published for about four hours and the, the open source community was pretty diligent and reported it, and the maintainer was also quite diligent. And so um, you know, anyone who happened to install it during the four-hour window was compromised, but it was removed relatively quickly. 
Uh, any software builds done in projects without using a lock file were compromised. And anyone who was unlucky enough to update to this new version of the package, or maybe who merged a bot PR to update to this new version during this time would have also been compromised. So this was big news in the JavaScript world, and I'm guessing that you may have already heard about this attack. Um, but this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, so we've been tracking uh, packages that are removed from NPM for security reasons, and we've seen um, over 700 packages removed for security reasons in just the last 30 days. Um, and I think this trend is accelerating as attackers take advantage of the open ecosystem and the trust that maintainers have for each other and the sort of liberal um, contribution policies that we've, uh, we've all sort of adopted in the modern open source era. So I think 2022 will be the year of supply chain security um, as the awareness of this issue is now coming to the fore. So one question you might ask is why is this happening now? I wanna start by just pointing out that what we're trying to do here <laughs> is kind of crazy. We're trying to download code from the internet written by unknown individuals that we haven't read, that we execute with full permissions on our laptops and our servers where we keep our most important data. So th this is what we're doing every day when we use NPM install. And I just have to say really quickly that, you know, I personally think it's a miracle that this system works, you know, and that it's continued to mostly work for this long. Um, it's a testament, I think, to how good most people are, um, but for, unfortunately, not everyone is, is, is good. So let's, let's dive into why this is happening now. The first reason is that 90% of your app's code comes from open source. So we're really standing on the shoulders of giants. And open source is the reason why we can get an app off the ground in hours and days instead of weeks or months. And it's the reason that we don't need to be an expert in cryptography or in time zones or the virtual DOM to build a powerful modern web app. It's also the reason why your node modules folder is one of the heaviest objects in the universe. <laughs> Another reason is that we have lots and lots of transitive dependencies. The way that we write software has changed. We use dependencies a lot more liberally. And so installing even a single dependency often leads to many, many transitive dependencies that come in as well. A 2019 paper at the Usenix conference actually found that installing an average NPM packages package introduces an implicit trust on 79 third-party packages and 39 maintainers, creating a surprisingly large attack surface. And so what we have here is a visualization that uh, my team at Socket created that shows you what Webpack looks like if you kind of go into the node modules folder and really look at what's inside. So each gray box here represents a package, and each purple box represents a file or files inside of a package. And so as you take away each layer of the dependency tree, you'll see that you just keep finding more and more packages nested inside the top level package, you know, until you eventually get down to the bottom here. But this is just an, an, an insane number of files and just a lot of modules uh, uh, flying around here. The next reason is that no one really reads the code. Um, you know, I, I, you know, there are some people who who do, but um, by and large, people don't look at the code that they're executing on their machines. One big reason is that NPM really doesn't make this very easy. If you go to you know, the package page for UA Parser JS and you click on the Explore tab here, you'll see that you, you can't even see the files of this package. Um, so people have to resort to clicking the GitHub link and going and checking GitHub and hoping that the code on GitHub matches the code that's on NPM, which is not necessarily true. But that's okay. That's okay. We can rely on Linus's law that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So if, there's, if there is a security issue in a package or malware in a package, we can rely on others to find it, right? But if everyone does that, then who is finding the malware? And so maybe this is the reason why, on average, a malicious package is available for 209 days before it's publicly reported. This comes from a research paper uh, by um, Ohm et al., so that's 209 days during which the wrong NPM command can end extremely badly. And I find this number personally very shocking. 
2021 paper at NDSS, a prestigious security conference, also found similar results, including that 20% of these malware persist in package managers for over 400 days and have more than 1,000 downloads. And the fourth reason is that popular tools give a false sense of security. A lot of popular tools scan for known vulnerabilities. So in 2022, I believe this is no longer sufficient. We can't just scan for known vulnerabilities and stop there. And yet that's what the most popular supply chain security products do, leaving you vulnerable. The thing is it can take weeks or months for a CVE or a known vulnerability to be discovered, reported, and detected by tools. And so it's just not fast enough. So it may be worth taking a minute here to just quickly distinguish between known vulnerabilities and malware because they're very different. Vulnerabilities are accidentally introduced by maintainers, by the good guys, and they have varying levels of risk. So sometimes it's okay to intentionally ship a known vulnerability to production if it's low impact. Even if you have vulnerabilities in production, they may not be discovered or exploited before you update to a fixed version. So you have some time to address these kinds of issues, usually. Now, malware, on the other hand, is quite different. Malware is intentionally introduced into a package by an attacker, almost never the maintainer, and it will always end badly if you ship malware to production. You don't have a few days or weeks to mitigate the issue. You need to really catch it before you install it on your laptop or on a production server. But in today's culture of fast development, a malicious dependency can be updated and merged in you know, a very short amount of time. And so unfortunately, you know, um, you know, this leads to increased risk of supply chain attacks because the quicker you update your dependencies, the fewer eyeballs that have had a chance to look at the code. And so I really think we need a new approach to detect and to block malicious dependencies. But before we get into that, let's look a little deeper into how a supply chain attack actually works and the mechanics of it. So we downloaded every package on NPM and we spent a few weeks poking around. The download uh, was 100 gigs of metadata and 15 terabytes of package tarballs. And as we poked around this uh, metadata and all these packages, uh, we, we noticed a few trends in the types of attacks we saw. So I'm gonna go over uh, these attacks. These are what we found. So there are attack vectors, which is sort of how the attacker tricks you and gets you to run their code in the first place. And then there are attack tactics, which are what the attack code actually does or the techniques that the attacker uses to, um, to get their code or to, to, to hide their code. So let's talk about attack vectors. The first and the most common attack vector is typo squatting. So typo squatting is when a package publishes, uh, an attacker publishes a package which has a very similar name to a legitimate and popular package. And so you can see here, there are two packages here with very similar names, uh, and uh, one of these is malware and one of these is the real package. But I would guess that it would be hard for you to know that um, without uh, actually cracking open these packages to see what's inside. So let's open up the malware package and uh, take a look at what it's doing. So you can see here, again, it's using an install script, which is a very common technique that malware uses. And if you open up this install script to look at the code, you'll find that the file is heavily obfuscated. But I can tell you, even without knowing exactly what this code is doing, you can bet this is not something that you wanna run on your machine. <laughs> the next uh, uh, attack uh, vector that we saw is uh, called dependency confusion. So this is pretty closely related to typo squatting. Dependency confusion happens when a company publishes packages to an internal NPM registry and uses a name that hasn't uh, been taken yet on the public NPM registry. And so later, an attacker can come along and register a package with the same name as the public uh, version and confuse internal tools so that internal tools will accidentally install the public version. So this is why it's called a dependency confusion attack. So looking through the recently deleted NPM packages, we were able to find a bunch of likely dependency confusion attacks, and most of these packages had malicious code in them. So all these packages have names which appear to conflict with internal company package names. And you can see here a whole bunch of, of different organizations, including governments, were um, you know, affected by this. Um, and here are a bunch more clearly targeting uh, you know, these specific companies here in this list. 
And finally, the third um, vector that we see a lot is hijacked packages. So these are the ones that you usually see in the news quite a lot. Um, you know, so criminals and thieves finding ways to infiltrate our communities and, and, and infect popular packages. Um, once they infect a popular package, uh, you know, once they get control of it and they can publish to it, they'll uh, steal credentials or install backdoors or abuse compute resources for cryptocurrency mining. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, these are these are um, you know th these these happen for for various reasons. So you know, some, sometimes it's because a maintainer chooses a weak password or reuses a password, um, or maybe the maintainer gets malware on their laptops. Um, this is also kind of not helped by the fact that npm doesn't enforce 2FA for all accounts currently, although they are starting to enforce this for the pop most popular accounts. And finally, uh, sometimes maintainers just get tricked uh, and give access to a malicious actor. This is partially just due to the fact that maintainers are overworked and when someone offers a helping hand, it's uh, sometimes hard to say no to, um, to the help. So uh, this, is, this is also a big uh, a vector as well. So now let's talk about um, some attack tactics. So what does this attack code actually, uh, actually do? So, so as we mentioned, uh, install scripts are a huge vector. Uh, most malware is in install scripts. Uh, and so mo this is a quote from a paper um, we mentioned earlier. So most malicious packages, actually 56%, start their routines upon installation, which might be due to poor handling of arbitrary code during install. Uh, so um, you know, in, 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 uh, in the NPM package manager, packages are allowed to just say, hey, uh, when this package is installed, we want to run some code. And so un unfortunately, though, install scripts do have some legitimate uses, so we can't just disable them. Uh, it's, it's not an easy problem to solve. So let's take a look at uh, just a, an example, another example of an install script. Uh, you know, it's again, you'll see it right here in the package JSON file. Super common. Um, yep. So the next is privileged API usage. So we see uh, packages accessing the network, accessing the file system, and accessing environmental variables. This is uh, you know very very common because when an attack code, when an attacker runs code, what they want to do usually is steal some secrets, and they need the network to exfiltrate those secrets. So this is a typical example of malware that does that. So you can see here that it's making an HTTP request to a um, a um, you know an IP address, and it's uh, it's sending uh, some data. And the data it happens to be sending is. Uh, process.env, which contains all the environment variables uh, in the environment. Uh, and then here is actually another uh, file that it includes, which is a different exfiltration technique that uses DNS instead of uh, HTTP. So the way this works is it creates a DNS resolver, and then it does a um, it gathers the, the environment variables, and then it does a, um, a DNS uh, um, lookup uh, with uh, those variables as the subdomain. So <laughs> it's just an, another way to get the data out of the system. And finally, we have obfuscated code. So we took a, we took a look at an example of this earlier. Um, so obfuscated code like this is just obviously it's really uh, hard to see at a glance what it's doing. Uh, although there are tools to attempt to unobfuscate code like this. Um, there's also another kind of obfuscation, um, which is attackers can publish different code to NPM that they than they do on GitHub. And so, uh, you know, when they do that, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, NPM doesn't make it easy to see what code is actually in the NPM package. And so, a lot of people who are trying to evaluate a package will rely on the code that's on GitHub, and there's no guarantee that that code is the same. Okay, so now let's talk about how you can protect your app. So you know, we asked ourselves this question. Um, you know, when we were working on uh, my company was working on a product called Wormhole, which lets you share files with end-to-end -end encryption. And our goal was to try to build the most secure and private way to send files. So you know, we did all the usual security things that we could think about. Um, you know, we 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 thought about security early in the design process. We wrote tests. We enforced code reviews, and we were pretty thoughtful about the dependencies that we chose to use. But um, you know, we um, we still felt like we could do better, and so um, we we started thinking really carefully about this problem and, and and what we could do to to make it better. So the first kind of thing uh, I recommend is that you can just try choosing better dependencies. Um, you know, if you ship code to production, you are ultimately responsible for it. And you know, as an industry, I think we need a mindset shift here because um, people people assume that they can just install stuff from the internet and that it's going to be safe. And it's not necessarily true. And 
If you're shipping code to production that includes open source code, then really ultimately that code is part of your app. And so uh, you are ultimately responsible for the behavior of that code. And you know the most popular open source license, the MIT license, actually literally says this in the license. It says that the open source code is provided as is with no warranty of any kind. And in no event shall the author be liable for any claim damages or liability. And so, you know, um, while this is legally true, most people don't think of their open source this way, and I think we, re we really do need a um, mindset shift. The other thing is very few of us actually read the code that we're shipping to production, and so um, uh, we, we rely on other heuristics to help pick dependencies. So maybe you know, we look at, does the code get the job done? Does it have an open source license? Does it have good docs? Does it have lots of downloads and GitHub stars? Does it have recent commits? Does it have types? Uh, and does it have tests? Um, and we're not really cracking open the code to, to go much beyond this. Um, so what that means is that we're, we're sort of not um, aware of, uh, of, of what the code may be doing. And so we built a tool at Socket to help with this problem. So you can quickly at a glance get an idea of the security of a package. Uh, and so this is what it looks like. So you can go to um, Socket and look up packages to figure out what uh, behavior the package has. And so in this example here, you can see that this package contains install scripts, and that's called out very prominently on the page, so it's the first thing that you see. And uh, this package also happens to contain uh, binary uh, you know, or native code, which uh, means that it's, it's not easy to audit the code. It's, it's, not, um, it's not like uh, human readable. Um, and so both of these issues are called out, and in this case, it's not necessarily, um, and this is not a, a supply chain attack by any means, but it is nice that this is called out very prominently so that you can make an informed decision if you want to use this package or not. You can also see that we have very helpful um, quality scores that show up at the top of the page as well. Now let's take a look at another example. So this package here, Angular Calendar, is quite a useful package. Um, it's a calendar component that you know shows up on the page and renders a, a, a little calendar. Um, but if you dig into its... Uh, dependencies, you'll actually find that some of its dependencies are doing quite invasive things. Um, so here you'll see that one of its dependencies contains install scripts. Um, it also uh, act, has a, uh, runs the shell scripts uh, and accesses the file system and accesses the network. So um, you know this, this is uh, probably not something that you would expect a component, a web component to be doing. Um, and so it may be um, worth a little bit of further investigation to figure out what's going on here before you use this package. Um, the other thing that we do that's quite cool is we um, can highlight when uh, packages uh, do these things and put that directly in line in the code. So in this package here, I opened it up to take a look at the files, and I could see here that the module is accessing the network as well as accessing environment variables. And I can see the exact lines where the package is doing each of these things. And so it makes it a little bit, little bit easier to get an idea of what a package is doing before you run it. So if you want to research packages on Socket before you um, use them, this is the URL you can use. And uh, I highly recommend you take a look at some packages uh, there and, and, and uh, use that information to make an informed decision before you select a package. OK, the other thing you can do is um, think about updating your dependencies at the right cadence. So um, what do I mean by this? So, there's a question about like how quickly you should update your dependencies. And this is actually a question we struggled with on our team as well. So if you, you know, you can think of it as should we update slowly or should we update really, really qu quickly and aggressively? If you update too slowly, you're exposed to known vulnerabilities and you're running code that's old and that you know may have issues, um, may have some bugs that, that have been fixed in a newer version. And so there's some downsides to updating too slowly. On the other hand, if you update too quickly, you expose yourself to supply chain attacks because you're now running code that may have been published, you know, literally yesterday or or in the last couple of days, which means that you haven't had that many eyeballs able to look at the code. And so, you know, if as you think about security, you you have to balance, uh, you know, this this trade off, and there really is no perfect solution here. Um, it's it's just a hard problem. Another idea is to um, audit every dependency. So, you know, if you're building a truly security critical application, uh, like we were doing with Wormhole, then um, you, you know, one option is to literally read every line of code of your dependencies. 
Uh, so if we again put this on um, um, on a on an axis uh, of um, starting from full audit on the one hand, reading every line of code to yoloing on the other hand, uh, and you know uh, by yoloing I mean like doing nothing. Um, how closely should you audit your dependencies? And what you see here is we're in the same situation. We have trade-offs and really no good uh, no good solutions. So doing a full audit is something that. Um, only the biggest and richest companies uh, seem to do in practice. Um, it's a lot of work. Usually you need to have a, a security team looking at every one of these packages, and they also have to approve them one at a time and, and add them to an allow list, which is really slow, and, and ex this is expensive just because of the time and the, and the effort that it takes. On the other hand, doing nothing and just installing whatever you want without you know, even looking at the code has its downsides. So it means that you're vulnerable to supply chain attacks. Um, it's risky. And you know, a, a, a breach or, 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 or bad security press uh, is also ex can be expensive, uh, especially as regulators start to crack down on this issue more. And so this is another like difficult trade-off. What, what do you do? Um, and most teams, I think, uh, Err on the side of, of doing nothing, uh, and um, uh, but I think you know I think this is just this is just a hard problem. So one thing that we tried to do when we were building Wormhole is is to sort of think about um, a happy medium. Is there a way to, to use automation to 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 kind of do something in the middle? Um, and so what we want to do, and what we've what we we ended up doing is using automation to automatically evaluate all of our dependencies. Uh, so we could use static analysis to look through packages to try to find malware, hidden code, typo squatting attacks, and this kind of thing. And that way we could manually audit only the most suspicious packages. So we could spend our limited team resources looking at the code for the, the most suspicious packages, and that's the most high impact way that, to, that we could spend our time. And so this is this seems much better to me than an all or nothing approach, where you either audit everything or you you just uh, hope for the best and look at nothing. Um, and then the other thing we wanted to do is make sure that the security uh, information was was shown directly in pull requests, so that uh, the developers on our team were empowered to solve the security issues that they uh, saw before they deployed into production. Um, so. What does this actually look like? So this is the bot that we created. Uh, it's a it's implemented as a GitHub app that you can install on your uh, GitHub repository, and whenever it sees that the package JSON file or the yarn.lock file has been modified, it will take a look at the new dependency that's been added, and it will run a full health report against that dependency. And if there's any issues found in it, it will leave a comment with uh, you know, whatever the issue is that was discovered. Uh, and so that, that way, the developer reviewing the pull request can look at it and have, have their attention drawn to this potential issue. Uh, and in this screenshot here, you can see that uh, I accidentally installed the package browser list instead of browsers list, which is uh, actually a very easy mistake to make. <laughs> um, and uh, for, for actually, for that reason, browser list, the, the, the uh, typo package actually has uh, something like 700,000 uh, downloads a year. Um, so, uh, so this is really, really helpful. This is the kind of thing that um, augments um, your review process. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's very low cost since it, it only raises issues that, um, you know, that are, are really worth your attention. And it, it runs automatically. So if you want to actually try this this app out, we've actually um, published it for anyone to use. Uh, it's it's free, so you can install our GitHub app by by just going to socket.dev, um, and uh, I yeah I recommend you you give it a try and uh, let me know what you think. It has a bunch of cool features, so it, it actually. Uh, can you know uh, block typo squats, uh, uh, which you know as, as I just showed you earlier, but also can uh, can block malware, detect hidden code, detect privileged API usage, uh, you know such as the use of file system, network, child process, etc. Um, and also it can detect uh, suspicious updates. So these are these are updates that significantly change the package's behavior. Um, so we have a whole bunch of. Uh, things we look for in packages. We actually have 70 detections in five different categories. Um, so we have supply chain risk, quality, maintenance, uh, known vulnerabilities, and license. And we wrote, basically, these are just all static analysis rules that we wrote. You can, you can kind of think of it, this as a linter in a way. So it's sort of looking at the uh, package's code and then um, you know, looking for, for these different uh, problems. We tried to focus all of the rules on problems which are, um, you know, something that you as a user of the package really want to know about, and not things that are that that require a lot of knowledge 
of the internals of the package. So the things that it finds need to be actionable to you as the developer choosing to use this package. And so that's what we tried to do in our, in our um, rule development here. So yeah, if you want to try this out, if you want to poke around uh, our website and look at these different issues, you can try it out at socket.dev. Um, and you know, uh, we have made it free for open source forever. Um, and if you have a private repo, it's free while we're in beta. And uh, you know, I, I really do uh, want people to give this a shot and uh, and share their feedback with us because this supply chain security problem is big and only getting bigger. And uh, you know, I I really do uh, want the community to share their feedback with me on this. And and uh, I, I think together we can really do a good job improving supply chain security in 2022 and uh, making 2022 not the year that the supply chain is destroyed, but rather the year that it's uh, that it's um, protected better than ever. So please share your feedback with me. Um, there's my email and my Twitter. And also we're hiring at Socket if you're interested in working on this project uh, and uh, helping to secure the software supply chain. Thanks for your time.